Jig Day on Tinian, resulted in remarkable success. The Marines completely surprised the defenders, by landing on beaches, Japanese considered unusable. By early afternoon, Marines of the 4th Marine Division, overcame relatively light resistance, much easier than anyone expected, and established a defensive perimeter, securing the beachhead. By 8 p.m. on the evening of July 24, 1944, 15,614 men of 10 Marine battalions, including one from the 2nd Marine Division, four artillery and one tank battalion, engineers, and other support troops, were safely ashore. The supplies arrived steadily, engineers cleared the mines, improving the landing site, and the man of the 2nd Marine Division, were loaded and ready to come ashore at dawn, over these same, but now improved beaches. Things had gone remarkably well, and as operations closed down for the day, General Schmidt and General Cates, could look back on that day, with considerable satisfaction. However, they both, as well as the other Marine officers, were already familiar with standard Japanese tactics, for repelling an invasion, after defense of the water's edge had been overcome, expecting the inevitable Japanese counterattack. Colonel Ogata, was not going to let them down. With Marine operations stopped for the night, it was time for Japanese troops of Tinian Garrison Force, to make their move. Positioned atop Mount Lasu, Colonel Ogata and his headquarters staff, could only observe the American advance inland, unable to do much about it, as the artillery and naval gunfire, pounded the area all day long realizing that the main American attack, came on the white beaches, and that all other force concentrations, were mere diversions. At 10 a.m., he ordered his reserve, the 1st Battalion of the 135th Infantry Regiment, and the tank company, to move north to the Mount Lasu area in preparation to push the American invasion force back to sea. The Imperial Navy units, stationed in the vicinity of white beaches, including the remnants of the 56th Naval Guard Force, who had defended White Beaches, and almost 1,000 men strong Imperial Naval troops, charged with the defense of the nearby airfields, joined Army troops, in preparation for an upcoming counterattack. Still hesitant, Ogata also ordered his 3rd Battalion and the 2nd Battalion of the 50th Infantry Regiment, to remain at their positions in front of Tinian Town and Asiga Bay, just in case of further American landings, in these areas. As the night came, the Japanese force began approaching the American beachhead, unaware that more than 15,000 well-dug-in marines, were directly in their path, awaiting their attack. At 10.30 p.m., the advancing Japanese, began to probe the beachhead perimeter, to learn the American defenses and search for weak spots. Covered by artillery and mortar fire, around midnight, the Japanese attack intensified. At the northeast side of the beachhead, 600 naval troops, attacked the line held by the 24th Marines. In wild close combat, by 7 a.m. the following morning, the Marines, assisted by armored amphibian vehicles firing support, from immediately offshore, repelled the counterattack, forcing the survivors to withdraw, leaving some 476 Japanese dead on the field. For the next several hours, Marines continued mopping up the remnants of the Naval Guard force. At the same time, when the attack on the 24th Marines began, further right, the Japanese struck a weak point, at the boundary between the 24th and 25th Marines. This time, the attackers were not the inexperienced sailors of the Naval Guard force, but the experienced and professional soldiers, of both the 50th and 135th Infantry Regiments, which had fought for years in China, before transferring to the Pacific. Well dug in American troops, repulsed the first attack, but a second quickly began. The second attack, was more successful, as a small number of enemy soldiers, managed to penetrate the perimeter line. Some 200 Japanese, poured into the Marines' rear areas, and then divided into two groups. One group, headed for the Marine artillery positions, while the second, turned towards the rear of the 25th Marines, in order to disrupt the defense, 
but ran on the reserve 3rd Battalion positions. By morning, Marines wiped out most of the enemies that penetrated the line. The 3rd Japanese attack of the night, came against the 23rd Marines, on the right flank. Here, Marines held a critical position, at the beachhead along the coast. The Japanese were equally aware, of the importance of this position, and so directed half of their limited amount of armor against it. Marines waited until the enemy armor got a few hundred meters in front of the main line, and then called artillery, on the approaching tanks. The artillery fire, did not stop the tanks, but illumination provided by Navy ships offshore, helped Marines to open fire with bazookas, 75mm guns mounted on half-tracks, and 37mm guns, dug into the front line, destroying five out of six Japanese tanks. The destruction of their armor, did not stop the soldiers of the 50th Infantry and 1st Battalion of the 135th Regiment, as they pressed their attack, until the fighting became hand-to-hand -hand combat. The morning revealed 267 dead Japanese, counted in this sector alone, which was only a fragment of the 1,241 Japanese killed during the night. The night counterattack, resulted in the complete annihilation of the 1st Battalion, 135th Regiment, and the 1st Battalion of the 50th Regiment. Combined with the losses, suffered during the pre-invasion bombardment, and those lost while defending the White Beaches, Tinian Garrison, ceased to exist as a fighting force, on the very first day of battle. On the morning of July 25th, the exhausted men of the 4th Marine Division, still held the line, after being in combat for more than 24 hours, without rest, in dire need of reorganization and resupply. Therefore, General Cates, postponed division's attack from 7 to 11 a.m., to provide his troops time to recover. Meanwhile, according to the plan, the first units of the 2nd Marine Division, began to land on white beaches. The 8th Marines, under Colonel Clarence Wallace, was the first unit to land during the morning, and was immediately attached to the 4th Marine Division, until the rest of the 2nd Marine Division was ashore, taking the position on the extreme left flank of the beachhead line along the shore. Throughout the day, the 2nd Marines under Colonel Walter Stewart, the 6th Marines, under Colonel James Risley, and the 2nd Division Command Group, with Division Commander General Thomas Watson, came ashore on white beaches. At 11 a.m., the 4th Marine Division, resumed its attack. On the extreme left, the 8th Marines, moved northward towards Ushi Point, encountering only light opposition, provided by scattered survivors of the counterattack the night before, mainly consisting of what was left, of the defenders of Ushi Point airfield. By afternoon, the 8th Marines, had the airfield in their possession. In the center, the 25th Marines, encountered much stronger opposition, when they came up against the 119-meter-high, sheer cliff face of Mount Maga. Colonel Batchelder, the 25th Marines commander, ordered his 1st and 3rd battalions, to swing to the right and left, while the 2nd battalion faced the cliff, and drew enemy attention away from the flanking movement. In an effort to reduce casualties, Batchelder used every asset assigned to him, and by combining tank support, provided by tank platoon, artillery fire, and close air support, Marines crashed Japanese defense by the end of the day, and went up Mount Maga, where they settled in for the night. The 24th and the 23rd Marines, had a relatively easy day, after the long hard night before, and advanced easily to the objective line for the day, by the early afternoon. Meanwhile, behind the front, there was much activity as well. The 14th Marines artillery, had had a difficult day, which started early in the morning, when they came under counter-battery fire, which killed the 14th Marines commander, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Zimmer, his headquarters staff, and seven more Marines, while another 14 Marines were wounded. As darkness settled over the island, Marines, unaware of the magnitude of the damage inflicted to the Japanese garrison the night before, dug in for the night, prepared to repel yet another attack. 
The night saw only minor infiltration attempts and skirmishes between patrols, accompanied by sporadic artillery shelling. On the morning of July 26, the 2nd Marine Division, by that time fully organized, with units previously attached to the 4th Marine Division, took over the eastern portion of the line. With 8th Marines on the left, and the 2nd Marines on the right, swiftly swept across the Ushi Point Flats, encountering little or no opposition, and cleared the northeast end of the island, south of Asiga Bay by 5 p.m., when they stopped and dug defensive positions for the night. Because of the swift advance, the Marines began moving beyond the range of the 24 Corps artillery, positioned on Saipan. Therefore, on July 26, the 24 Corps artillery, concentrated its fire on Mount Lassu, to support the advance of the 4th Marine Division. With the 23rd Marines on the right, and the 25th Marines on the left, while behind them, the 24th Marines, rested and mopped up rear areas at Mount Maga, the 4th Marine Division, moved forward at 8 a.m. The division's main objective for the day, was securing Mount Lassu. Because of its obvious value as an observation point to the enemy, the Marines expected a fierce fight for possession of the hill, but as they moved up its steep slopes, they were surprised and relieved, to find that the enemy had abandoned the height without a fight. By 4.30 p.m., the 4th Marine Division, reached its day's objective, and stopped for the night. The first days on Tinian, had gone better than expected. The beachhead was secured, and with two, although under strength Marine Divisions ashore, there was no doubt about the final outcome. The flow of supplies ashore, continued unabated on small beaches, despite the damaged pontoon causeway on White 2, caused by Japanese artillery fire. Also, the tanks proved their value, on large flat cane fields, on an island with a good road system, that permitted them room and access to maneuver. They generally spearheaded the infantry advance, while pouring heavy fire into cane fields, thickets and all buildings, that had the capacity to shelter the enemy. As the night fell, most of the front lines, remained quiet. However, in the zone of the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, unusual things began to happen. The battalion, came under repeated Japanese probes, not severe, but constant and widespread. When Marines faced their front, they were suddenly hit from the rear, by a large group of Japanese soldiers, in an effort to escape from the Marine perimeter. The night fight resulted in 187 Japanese dead, in front of and behind American lines, while two Marines had been killed, and another two wounded. The same evening, the Marine Command, made some changes in their operations. General Schmidt, realized that the enemy was withdrawing, and rather than push his Marines forward into the unknown, he adopted a tactic, later called elbowing. Now, when Marines advanced way south, beyond the range of the 24 Corps artillery, positioned on Saipan, Schmidt, decided to make the main attack of the day, with only one Marine division, while the other division, would rest and remain in its position. The following day, the roles would be reversed. In this way, each day, one division would have the full support of the entire artillery, and naval gunfire available to 5th Amphibious Corps, and he also wanted to confuse the enemy, and thereby reduce his defensive capability. As this tactic, resembled a man elbowing his way through a crowd, it became known as the elbowing tactic. On July 27, the elbowing tactic, was put into practice, with the 2nd Marine Division, taking the lead. In 6 hours and 15 minutes, the Marines advanced some 3,500 meters, against sporadic machine gun and rifle fire, clearing a sea point, and although, there were still some hours of daylight left, the 2nd Marine Division, according to plan, stopped and dug defensive positions for the night. On the left, adjoining the 2nd Marine Division, the 25th Marines, moved slowly to prevent the gap between the two divisions, finding almost no resistance. The following day, July 28, it was the turn of the 4th Marine Division, to advance first. Within four hours, Marines reached their objective set for the day, 
and again resistance was negligible. With the quick advance, and lack of opposition, General Cates, came to an idea, to move his division forward to the next day's objective, and establish a defensive line along a narrower front. Cates persuaded General Schmidt, who approved his request. In the early afternoon, the 4th Marine Division, moved forward, reaching its new objective by 5.30 p.m., without any contact with the enemy. Meanwhile, Marines of the 2nd Marine Division, felt bored sitting in their foxholes, without any sight of the enemy, so they also moved forward, ending the day in parallel, with their fellows from the 4th Marine Division. On the afternoon of July 28, new problems struck Americans, not resulting from increased Japanese resistance, but because of deteriorating weather conditions. West of the Mariana Islands, a typhoon began to build up, and its effects began to be felt, along the coast of Tinian. The winds and waves, increased in volume and began to hit the white beaches with increasing ferocity by 6 p.m., preventing all unloading on both white beaches. Nevertheless, the weather conditions, didn't prevent both divisions from receiving another battalion-sized reinforcement, which brought neither division up to authorized strength, although it did contribute to a speedier campaign. Because exceedingly well progress on Tinian, for July 29, rather than establishing objective lines for the day, as had been the practice, General Schuett, ordered his two division commanders, to advance as far, and as fast as they chose. As a result, the Marines of the 4th Marine Division, moved off to the south at dawn, without any artillery or naval gunfire preliminary bombardment, and the 2nd Marine Division, attacked alongside them. The 4th Marine Division, advanced steadily, encountering only small groups of Japanese troops, and isolated pockets of resistance opposing them. By mid-afternoon, the division had reached positions, overlooking Tinian Town and the terrain beyond, an ideal site for both defences for the night, and a launching place, for the next day's attack, where they halted for the evening. The attack of the 2nd Marine Division, started off against no opposition, but the further they advanced, the Japanese resistance increased. The Marines came under machine gun and mortar fire, and once they positioned themselves for an attack, the Japanese troops faded away to set up new defensive positions, just ahead of the advance. This pattern, repeated itself every time the Marines encountered resistance. As the Japanese held no defensive line, they would move their defenses back, each time the Marines prepared an assault, causing the advance of the 2nd Marine Division, to start and stop constantly, all day long. The following night, was a miserable one for everyone on Tinian. The rain poured through all night, keeping both sides from getting any rest, and preventing almost any action. The same defensive pattern, the Japanese repeated the following day, when at the dawn of July 30, the 2nd Marine Division resumed the attack. As Marines advanced south, they faced much stiffer resistance, than in previous days, realizing that the remnants of Tinian garrison force, withdrew south, and that heavy fighting lay ahead. By the end of the day, the men of the 2nd Marine Division, had to destroy several well-emplaced Japanese positions on top of higher ground and in nearby caves. The main objective, of the 4th Division Day's attack, was the seizure of Tinian Town. Based on pre-invasion intelligence reports, this area was heavily defended, and Marine commanders, expected a heavy fight for the town. Because of the same reason, Tinian Town, was the target of the offshore naval gunfire, from support ships, which pounded the area from the beginning of the invasion. As they approached their objective, the Marines had to clear several isolated pockets of resistance, harassed by the Japanese mortar fire, along the way. At 2.25 p.m., on July 30, the 24th Marines entered Tinian Town. By that time, the naval bombardment had reduced the town, to numerous piles of debris, to the point where even its former streets, were no longer distinguishable. Only one, brave Japanese soldier defended the town, who sacrificed himself, in the effort to stop the entire Marine Division. Having secured the town, 
the Marines moved beyond it, and established themselves along the new defensive line by nightfall. As the new day came, the two Marine divisions, had four-fifths of the island seized, and clearly, the fight was far from over. From the increased resistance they faced the previous day, it was clear that the Japanese, had chosen to make their last stand, on the rugged terrain, on the southern end of the island. Indeed, General Schmidt, was aware that the next few days, would bring the climax of the entire campaign, and as the objective for July 31st, he set the extreme south coast of Tinian Island. Therefore, to save the lives of his marines in this last push, Schmidt decided to begin the day with preliminary bombardment, by all artillery and navy ships available, as well as the support, of 126 aircraft. 31st of July, began with heavy bombardment, lasting from 6 to 8 a.m. The navy and artillery, pounded the cliffs along the south coast of Tinian, and in between the shelling, Air Force aircraft, including 16 B-25 bombers, just recently arrived on Saipan, pounded the same cliffs. At 8.30 a.m., men of two marine divisions began, what they believed to be, the final attack on Tinian. This time, the advance was not a walk through cane field, as in previous days, but a heavy and wild fight against well-prepared defensive positions, and a determined enemy. Besides, mines and rough terrain, slowed the Marines' advance. Nevertheless, despite all these obstacles, the Marines reached the top of the cliff. However, as the night approached, it was clear they won't finish the job, and that another day of fighting, was ahead. Once on the cliff, the Marines began preparing for the night. Meanwhile, still during the day, between the two divisions a 500 meters wide gap appeared, that was not, despite all efforts, closed by night. The anticipated Japanese counterattack came during the night, at about 11 p.m. Unlike the previous counterattack, on the first night of battle, which was a coordinated effort to drive Americans to sea, this was the typical Japanese Banzai charge, with the accompanying screaming and shouting, with the only purpose of self-sacrifice, and inflicting as many casualties as possible to the Marines. The heavy and accurate Marine fire, stopped and shattered the enemy force, before they reached the inner perimeter. However, a force estimated at about 150 Japanese troops, took advantage of the existing gaps between the units, and set up a roadblock, burned two ambulance jeeps and closed the road. A mixed ad hoc created marine unit, pushed the enemy back, and survivors disappeared into the night. The second Japanese counter-attack, came at 5.15 am on August 1st. After nearly 30 minutes of intense combat, the survivors withdrew, leaving over 100 dead bodies in front of the marine line. The marines got little rest, after the long day, and night of July 31st. As the dawn of August 1st arose, both divisions pushed out, to finish the job of taking Tinian. The advance to the coast began at about 8 a.m., and the Marines encountered lighter opposition, formed of small Japanese groups, using the advantages of the terrain and undergrowth, to harass the Marine advance. By 6 p.m., the 4th Marine Division, reached the coast. The 2nd Division, advanced against practically no opposition, until they reached the cliff overlooking the coast. At 6.55 p.m., on August 1, 1944, General Schmidt, declared Tinian secured. However, the Battle of Tinian was maybe over, but the fighting, was not. For the next seven days, the Marines cleared caves on the southern edge of the island, and although disorganized, the resistance was still active. In this period, almost 400 Japanese troops were killed. During the fighting on Tinian, the Marines lost 326 men killed, and an additional 1,593 wounded. Out of almost 9,000 Japanese troops on the island, only 252 surrendered. Shortly after the battle, Tinian was turned into a large construction site. North Field Air Base, 
was built over the old airfields No. 1 and 3, and became operational in February 1945. The old airfield No. 2, became West Field with newly added runways, and was completed in March 1945. Both airfields, became the base of hundreds of B-29 Superfortress bombers, of the 20th Air Force, for their daily raids against the Japanese home islands. For supply of bombers and other units on the island, a naval base for cargo ships, was constructed in front of Tinian Town. In May 1945, North Field Air Base on Tinian, became a base of the 509th Composite Group, under the command of Colonel Paul Tibbets, a special air unit, organized to drop an atomic bomb. It was from Tinian, that B-29s took off, to drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, on 6th and 9th of August 1945. The success of the Battle of Tinian, did not go unnoticed. Although largely overshadowed, by the other fierce battles at the Pacific Theater, the operation was, in later years, praised by the two most experienced amphibious commanders, in United States military history. Therefore, for the seizure of Tinian, Admiral Raymond Spruance was later referred to as, the most brilliantly conceived and executed amphibious operation in World War II. At the same time, General Holland Smith also later described it as, the perfect amphibious operation, of the Pacific War.